السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآل آله وصحبه وسلم وشر العمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار وبعد Then welcoming all of the brothers and sisters that have attended today to this first dars in the durus concerning the explanation of the aqeedah of Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah by the great Imam, Imam al-Barbahari rahimahullahu ta'ala in his book entitled Sharh al-Sunnah explained by the great scholar of our era Sheikh Salih bin Fawzan bin Abdullah al-Fawzan so the book that we've decided to cover and to, exp- uh, and to mention and to read is the book known as Ittihaf al-Qari Bita'aliqat ala sharh al-sunnah lil imam Abi Muhammad al-Hassan bin Ali bin Khalaf al-Barbahari rahimahullahu ta'ala died in the year 329 after the Hijra. Or Ittihaf al-Qari, a gift to the reader in annotated notes upon the Sharh al-Sunnah, the book known as Sharh al-Sunnah of Imam al-Barbahari rahimahullah by the great scholar and the Sheikh of our era, Salih bin Fawzan bin Abdullah al-Fawzan, Hafidhullahu ta'ala. The book is available in, in Arabic in two volumes. There is a, the, the, the translation of the text itself, however, was done by our noble brother and our teacher, uh, Sheikh Abu Talha Dawood Barbank, rahimahullahu ta'ala, who passed away during the period of Hajj of last year. And that book is available, known as Explanation of the Creed. And for those of you who wish to follow the, uh, the English translation of that which Imam al-Barbahari has stated, then that is available in text form. And those footnotes in that book, Explanation of the Creed, by Imam al-Barbahari, translated by our brother Abu Talha, rahimahullah, uh, then the footnotes are actually a compilation of that which he gleaned from the durus of Sheikh Salih al suhaimi Havidahullah Ta'ala from the scholars of Medina. But this actual work, Barbahari in two volumes, published by uh, published in explanation of, Bar- of, of Sharh al-Sunnah of al-Barbahari is by Sheikh al-Fawzan. And that is what we are working upon in publishing in uh, the near future, inshallah. So both the brothers and sisters who attend then they are of course most welcome to attend the sisters are if they wish they can sit in the back of at the back of the masjid or if they wish they can sit in the uh, in the place allocated for the women uh, in the classrooms or in the exit area as they are towards the back of this masjid i'm not going to go through the whole of the muqaddimah or the whole of the muqaddimat in fact or the uh, various introductions to the book and the studies uh, that are in the book because they number somewhere in the region of 48 pages. The introduction itself numbers in the region of 48 pages. They mention the muqaddimah of the compiler who took the position, who took the permission from Sheikh al-Fawzan. Also mentions the biography of Imam al-Barbahari, which we will cover, I think that's important. The biography of Sheikh al-Fawzan. And inshallah, the Sheikh al-Fawzan is well known to the brothers for his knowledge and his ilm. So uh, I won't be entering into that either. And then there is a, there is a chapter that uh, the methodology that, that the uh, compiler has used in authenticating the actual manuscript of Sharh al-Sunnah of Imam al-Barbahari. And then there's a few pages in photocopy form of the actual manuscript, handwritten script of Barbahari, followed by the, a photocopy or a scanned copy of that which is found where this uh, Sharh al-Sunnah is taken from from the Tabaqatul Hanabila of, uh, uh, of Ibn Abi Ya'la. And then we enter into the Muqaddimah, or the introduction of the book itself by Fadilat al-Sheikh Salih al-Fawzan. 
that which we will be reading because that introduction is extremely important. So we'll begin, inshallah, today. But as time goes on, inshallah, on uh, on the websites, so if you talk, uh, some of these introductions we placed on there anyway. I think going into detail in some of these researches that are in the introduction are 48 and odd pages, uh, may be a bit too heavy for the audience at hand. Uh, so we'll take that which I, which I believe is beneficial from it and we'll read it and then we'll enter into the introduction of Sheikh Al-Fawzan and then we'll enter into the meat of the book itself with the explanation of Sheikh Al-Fawzan, insha'Allah. So we'll begin in the first study that is brought, Al-Mabhath Al-Awwal, or the first study, or the first of the introductions, which enters into the name, Ismuhu wa kunyatuhu wa nasabuhu. His name, his title, and his is, uh, ascription. Then, <coughs> in the tarjima, it is mentioned, Huwa al-imam, al-qudwa, al-mujahid, shaykh al-hanabila, wa kabiruhum, fi asrihi, Abu Muhammad, al-Hassan, bin Ali, bin Khalaf, al-Barbahari. So he mentions, this is the, uh, this is the introduction of the, of the man himself, the imam, al-Barbahari. He mentions that he is the imam. The example that is followed, the mujahid, the sheikh of the Hanbali scholars, the greater of them in his era. He is Abu Muhammad, so that's his kunya, the father of Muhammad. Al-Hassan bin Ali bin Khalaf al-Barbahari. Then he mentions, وَبَرْبَهَارِ هِيَ الْأَدْوِيَةُ الَّتِي تُجْلَبُ مِنَ الْهِنْدِ he mentions that the ascription is to Barbahar. And Barbahar is a, are a type of medicine. Or they are medicines imported and, and obtained from India, from Hind. Then he mentions that he was born in the year 253 after the Hijra. Born in the year 253 after the Hijra. Now, that shows that he was born about 10 or more or 12 years after the death of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And when Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala died, then he was three years old, Imam al-Barbahari. So he comes immediately after that generation. And he was born during the, during the Khilafah of Mu'tazzi Billah, Muhammad, the son of the Caliph, al-Mutawakkil, al-Mutawakkil al-Allah, Ja'far. The son of Mu'tasim Billahi al-Abbasi. So this was the era in which he was born and these were the rulers of that time. It was a time of the despotic rule under the authority of the Turkmans. They appointed whomsoever they wished as the Khalifa and they dismissed as they wished. And the situation did not stabilize up until the Khilafah of Mu'tamad al-Allah, of the, the, the leader, Al-Mu'tamad Al-Allah. So Imam Al-Barbahari grew up in this unstable political environment. An environment also of flourishing knowledge, where Ahlul Sunnah were widespread in the land. Imam Al-Barbahari was a contemporary of a group of Imams, such as Imam Ibn Majah, Al-Qazwini, Abu Dawood, Al-Sijistani. Both of them, of course, Ibn Majah and Abu Dawood, the compilers of the Sunan. Anyone know the name of Abu Dawood since we've studied the book of his son? No. Suleiman ibn al Ash'ath. Suleiman ibn al Ash'ath. And that is Abu Dawood, his son, of course. As you know, Ibn Abi Dawood, the Sijistani. Abu Bakr, Abdullah bin Suleiman al Ash'ath. Or Ibn Abi Dawood, al Sijistani. And that's the book, inshallah, that we study every Friday. The Ha'iyah of Ibn Abi Dawood, al Sijistani. So he mentions also Hanbal bin Ishaq. Imam Abu Bakr al-Marrudi and some of these are of course companions of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal such as Hanbal bin Ishaq was a student of Imam Ahmad Imam Abu Bakr al-Marrudi was a student of Imam Ahmad Ishaq bin Ibrahim bin Hani Abu Bakr al-Khallal Ibn Qutayba al-Daynawari and other than them from those who were from the foremost Imams of that era Imam al-Barbahari accompanied a group of the students and companions of, Imam, of the Imam of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah, Ahmed bin Hanbal, rahimahullah. 
He took knowledge from them, had a great, uh, and, and they had a great effect upon his character and his personality. Personality. As for his shiuch, lil'ilm, his sheikhs, and his pursuit of knowledge, then Imam al Barbahari rahimahullah taala, then he excelled in the pursuit of knowledge, and in his desire to attain it. He attained knowledge from a group of the senior companions of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah taala, and then he mentions a list of them. From them, Ahmed bin Muhammad ibn al Hajjaj. Abu Bakr al-Marrudi. And Imam al-Marrudi, ya ikhwan, was from the great a'imma of his time. He was the imam, the example to be followed, the faqih, the scholar of hadith. He settled in Baghdad and he was a companion of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and he died in the year 275 after the hijra. Also, from those he studied under was Sahal bin Abdullah bin Yunus At-Tustari, Abu Muhammad. He was the Imam, the ardent worshipper, and the one who was known for abstinence, for his zuhud. And he died in the year 283 after the Hijrah. Also from his scholars was Al-Fatih bin Shukhruf. He was from the ardent worshippers, known also for his zuhud, for his abstinence from the dunya and not having concern for it. It is narrated from Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal that he said, no one came out of Khurasan of the likes of Al-Fatih bin Shukhruf. And he died in the year 273 after the Hijra. His status in knowledge, Imam al-Barbahari rahimahullah ta'ala was an awe-inspiring Imam. A person who was outspoken with regard to the truth. A caller to the Sunnah and a follower of the narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was fully acquainted with the Madhab, the Madhab here referring to the Madhab of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. That he was fully acquainted with the Madhab, its fundamentals and its branches. He had standing and respect with the ruler. He was severe against the people of innovations and desires. He used to combat them with his hand and with his tongue, meaning that he used to write against them and he used to speak against them. His gatherings were abundant with the mention of, of the hadith, the, the athar and fiqh, and it was attended by many of the imams of hadith and fiqh of that era. So the scholars themselves and the imams used to sit in the circles of Imam al-Barbahari. Abu Abdullah al-Faqih, rahimahullah, he said, if you see a person of Baghdad loving Abu al-Hassan bin Bashar, and also Abu Muhammad al-Barbahari rahimahullah, then know that he is a person of sunnah. From that which shows his rank and his high station is that which his student, Ibn Batta. And Ibn Batta, of course, ya ikhwan, was from the contemporaries also of Ibn Abi Dawud al-Sijistani, if you recall, and from those who narrated, and was from the students of Ibn Abi Dawud al-Sijistani. So Ibn Batta was also a student of Imam al-Barbahari. He said that I heard, meaning Imam al-Barbahari say when the pilgrims of, pilgrims of Hajj, that they were seized or they were detained. He said, O people, whoever is in need of assistance to the amount of a hundred thousand dinar, and then another hundred thousand dinar, and then five times over, I will assist him. Ibn Batta said, if he had wished, he could have attained that from the people. Walaikum salam wa he also had some serene poetry. And from his poetry, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, there is that which has been mentioned from him, that he said, whoever satisfies himself with what suffices him, he begins rich and, in conti and, uh, con and continues in following the correct way. What a fine attribute Allah has made in being satisfied with that which suffices. How many a humble person it has uh, Nam, how many a humble person it has raised high, meaning this, de this, this desire just to be satisfied with what he has been given. The soul of the youth feels constricted if he is poor, but if he patiently depends on his Lord, indeed he will be given vastness of ease and sufficiency. As for the zuhud and the piety and the abstinence of 
this great Imam, Imam al-Barbahari was known for his zuhd, his abstinence from the dunya and his piety. This is indicated by what has been mentioned by Abu hassan bin Bashar, the Imam al-Barbahari, that he shunned 70,000 dirhams which he inherited from his own father. Ibn Abi Ya'la said, Rahimahullah, that al-Barbahari had great striving and stood firm for the religion many times. The students of Imam al-Barbahari, then he has a great number of students. A Talamid, Talamid al-Imam al-Barbahari, rahimahullah ta'ala, and a great number of people from the students acquired knowledge and benefit from al-Barbahari, rahimahullah. And from them, we have the first one that he mentions, the Imam, the exemplary example, the jurist, Abu Abdullah, Ubaidullah, or Ubaidullah, bin Muhammad al-Ukbari, famously known as Ibn Batta. Secondly, the Imam, the great admonisher, Muhammad bin Ahmed bin Ismail al-Baghdadi, Abu al-Hussein. Naam, Abu al-Hussein bin Sam'ud. Thirdly, he mentions Ahmed bin Kamil bin Khalaf bin, Sh uh, bin Shajara, Abu Bakr al-Qadi. Then he also mentions the Imam, the jurist, al Hussein bin Abdullah al-Baghdadi al-Hanbali, Abu Ali al-Najjad al-Saghir, died in the year 360. And finally he mentions Muhammad bin Ahmed bin Salih, the son of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, who died in the year 330. So from his students was the son of the Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, rahimahullah ta'ala. As for his trial and his death, then he mentions that Ibn Abi Ya'la said, meaning in Tabaqatul Hanabila, which is a book from which the Aqeedah of Imam al Barbahari is taken. Sharh Sunnah is taken from Tabaqatul Hanabila uh, amongst other places. The Imam al Barbahari had great striving and stood firmly for the religion many times. The Mukhalifun, the opposers of the Sunnah, that they enraged the heart of the Sultan against Barbahari. So in the year 321, during the Khilafah of Al-Qahir, he ordered his governor, Ibn al-Muqla, to arrest Al-Barbahari. So then Al-Barbahari, rahimahullah, he went into hiding. However, a number of his companions were captured and they were taken to Basra. Allah the Mighty and Majestic punished Ibn al-Muqla for this misdeed by causing Al-Qahir to become angry with him. So Ibn al-Muqla himself, the one who tried to arrest al-Barbahari, fled and al-Qahir stripped him from his governorship and burnt down his house. Then al-Qahir Billah himself was arrested, meaning the one who ordered Muq Ibn Muqla. He himself was arrested on Thursday the 6th of Jumad al-Akhirah in the year 322. He himself was imprisoned, stripped of his position and both of his eyes were gouged out on this day, leaving him blind. Then Allah granted that Al-Barbahari returned to his honorable position and more, such that when Abu Abdullah bin Arafa, well known as Niftaway, died, his funeral was attended by many prominent and important people and scholars, yet the congregation was led by Al-Barbahari in the Janazah. That was in the month of Safar, in the year 323 after the Hijrah. It was in this year the Al-Barbahari standing grew and his speech carried greater weight and his students became manifest and widespread, forbidding and censuring the innovators and the people of Bid'ah. However, the innovators did not cease in trying to turn the heart of the Caliph, Ar-Radi, against Al-Barbahari, rahimahullah ta'ala, to the point that Ar-Radi ordered Badr, Al Kharshani, Al Kharshani, who was in charge of the police, to ride out in Baghdad with the proclamation that not even two of the students of Al Barbahari were allowed to gather together. So he again went into hiding. And he, he, uh, naam, he had previously at that stage settled in the west of the city at Babul Muhawwal. So he left that, so he left that secretly for the east of the city. And he died in hiding in the, in the month of Rajab 
in the year 329 after the Hijrah. And he reached the age of 76 at that time. And it is also said that he reached the age of 77. And one can read the, tar read the tarjama or the biography and also the, the, the original text of Sharh al-Sunnah of Imam al-Barbahari. You can read it in Tabaqatul Hanabila, volume 2, page 18. And also Seer, Alam al-Nubala, in volume 15, page 90. And also in, in, also in the work of Ibn al-Athir and other places. But these are the most, two most prominent places where what, what we have said has been taken. He died, of course, in hiding. And it is said that no one prayed over him except a single person. And it is said that, the, that even though no, human, no other human prayed over him, the lady in whose house he was hiding, when she opened the door to look at the, look at the janazah, she said that the room was filled with people wearing garments of white and green. So when the man who prayed over him left and she said that, did you see what I saw? He said, did you see it too? She said, yes. She said, indeed, you have destroyed me. Bury him in that place in my house. And then when I die, bury me next to him. So this is the, 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 the life of Imam al-Barbahari rahimahullah ta'ala. But even though he died in hiding because the innovator that had turned the hearts throughout, the, throughout his life, but the people of bid'ah and misguidance had turned the hearts of the authorities against Imam al-Barbahari rahimahullah ta'ala. He remained steadfast. And that is now, in the year that he died, 329, that over a thousand years later, my brothers and sisters, that the legacy of Imam al-Barbahari remains, even though the man died alone in hiding. Even though he died alone. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises whom he wills. And Allah jalla wa ala debases whom he wills. That so much so that over a thousand years later that we recite the name and we, and we remember the name of Imam Abu Muhammad al-Barbahari rahimahullah ta'ala and we remember him as the Imam of the Sunnah. There's also, even though it's not in this particular work, but when I went back to Seer Alam al-Nubala of Imam al-Dahabi rahimahullah ta'ala who died in the year 748 after the Hijrah and Seer Alam al-Nubala is a collection of of the biographies of the Salaf and the Sahaba and other than them. In a, in, and it is, a, it is a voluminous work. In volume 15 of this work, on page 90, that Imam al, -Bar that Imam al Dhahabi said, showing the firmness and the strength and the honor and the respect that Imam al Barbahari held in his age, that he mentions Faqil, Inna al Ash'ariya, Lamma qadima Baghdad, Jaa ila Abi Muhammad al Barbahari. Ja'a ila Abi Muhammad al-Barbahari. He said that it is said that al-Ash'ari, meaning Abu al-Hassan al-Ash'ari, that when he entered into Baghdad, that he went to Abu Muhammad al-Barbahari. You all should know who Abu al-Hassan al-Ash'ari is. Abu al-Hassan al-Ash'ari was from the imams of the Mu'tazila. Then he repented from that and made tawbah. And he stood upon the member in Basra and he stood upon the member and he made tawbah he said that I used to say I used to deny the ulu of Allah and I used to deny that the Quran is the speech of Allah and I used to deny many of the attributes of Allah he said indeed I have made tawbah from that and I have repented from that and then he took off his garment and he, and he lifted it up in the air and he said I repent from that as I remove this garment of mine and he dropped it to the floor. So this is the tawbah. This is the tawbah of Abu al-Hassan al-Ash'ari rahimahullah ta'ala. He died in the year 324. Six, uh, five years before Imam al-Barbahari. But they met each other. He entered into Baghdad. And he looked for Imam al-Barbahari. He went to Imam al-Barbahari. Then he mentions. فَجَعَلَ يَقُولْ رَدَدْتُ عَلَى الْجُبَّائِ He said, indeed I have refuted I have refuted radattu al jubba'i I have refuted al jubba'i al jubba'i was from the teachers of Abu al-Hassan and from the heads of the Mu'tazila He said radattu al al majus and I have refuted the majus the magians wa al nasara and likewise I have refuted the Christians So Abu Muhammad Imam al-Barbahari he looked at him faqala Abu Muhammad la adri ma taqul he said, I don't know what you're talking about. 
He said, وَلَا نَعْرِفْ إِلَّا مَا قَالَهُ الْإِمَامْ أَحْمَدْ And he said, and we do not know anything except that which was uttered by Imam Ahmed. Meaning that our aqeedah, whatever you're saying, I don't know what you're talking about. As for us, then we are upon that which Ahmed ibn Hanbal was upon. فَخَرَجَ Meaning, Al-Ash'ari, he left. وَالسَّنَّفَ Al-Ibana So he left and then he authored his work, Al-Ibana and Usul al-Diyana. He authored his work in, uh, in, ref- in, in uh, clarification and repentance and clarification and in retracting that which he was upon from the ideas of, of the Mu'tazila and the ideas of Al-Jubba'i and the ideas of Ibn Kullab that he repented from that and then he wrote this book Al-Ibana and it is said that this was the final work that he wrote. So after writing this work then Imam al-Dahabi said فَلَمْ يُقْبَلْ مِنْهُ and even this wasn't accepted from him, meaning that Imam al-Bahar Bahari didn't even accept that from him. Showing, as many of the Mashaykh have mentioned, from them Shaykh Abu Uthman, Muhammad al-Anjari, Hafidhullah Ta'ala, he mentions that this shows the sternness of the Imams of the Salaf towards those who were, who were the callers to bid'ah, because Abu al-Hasan was from the Imams of the Mu'tazila in his time, even though he repented from that. So Shaykh Al-Anjari mentions that it wasn't the fact that no one accepted his tawbah. They accepted his tawbah. But they were not going to raise him up again. That they were not going to raise him amongst the people. That yesterday you were an imam of bid'ah and today you're going to become an imam of the sunnah because you have recanted. Because his nurturing was upon what? Upon bid'ah. His nurturing was at the hands of the Mu'tazila. And at the hands after the Mu'tazila when he left them, then he was at the hands of Ibn Kullab. And then when he wrote, this was towards the end. So his whole nurturing, most of his life was upon that. So Imam al-Barbahari and, uh, and likewise the rest of the students, as Shaykh Falah, Hafidhullah, when I asked him about this issue, he said that the students of Imam Ahmed, that they were stern against Abu al-Hassan, Abu al-Hassan al-Ash'ari. They were stern against him. Not that they rejected his tawbah, because his tawbah is between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they hoped for him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would accept his tawbah from the bid'ah that he was upon. Their fear was that he would be raised amongst, amongst Ahlul Sunnah just as he was raised amongst the Mu'tazila. And after receiving a lifetime of nurturing upon the ideas of the people of bid'ah. And they also mentioned, as Shaykh Al-Anjari mentioned and Shaykh, Shaykh Falah likewise, that they mentioned also that even though he repented that there were still some remnants of the doctrines of the, of the Mu'tazila and Ibn Kullab, even towards the end of his life in some of his writings. Meaning that some of that was, he was still tainted with. That, he, that, that because he, when he repented, that he was raised for all of these years upon that, then some of that remained with him. So the ulama of that time, showing the firmness of them, number one, against innovations. Secondly, that not that they would reject the tawbah of a person who left his bid'ah and came to the sunnah, but they were careful about raising him without first monitoring him and watching him to see if his tawbah was sadiqah, if his tawbah was a sincere tawbah. But look at the reaction of Abu hassan al-Ash'ari, the sincerity of the man. That here Abu hassan al-Ash'ari, rahimahullah ta'ala, that even though he was, that he was venerated and honored amongst the people of Bid'ah, thousands used to flock to Abu hassan al-Ash'ari, when he was with the people of Bid'ah, he was an imam, and they say, even Imam al-Dahabi, because the biography that comes before the biography of al-Barbahari is the biography of Abu hassan al-Ash'ari in Seer Alam al-Nubala, in volume 15, that the biography that comes before the biography of, Abu, of uh, al-Barbahari is the biography of Abu hassan al-Ash'ari. In that, he mentions the, 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 the intelligence Imam al-Dahabi mentions how intelligent Abu al-Hassan was and how grounded he was in the ideas of the Mu'tazila. That he was from the imams of the Mu'tazila and then he repented. And then he mentions in the manner in which he repented. That he didn't hide his repentance. That he was forthright when he realized after delving into the depths of the ideas of the Jahmiyyah and the Mu'tazila and likewise the ideas of the people of falsafa, philosophy and likewise the ideas of his teacher of his, fine, of, his late, uh, of, his, of his teacher after his first repentance, Ibn Kullab, that even after that when he repented, 
that he was still seen as the most intelligent men of his era with regard to the deen of Islam. And the danger was that, the, that, that if he had, if his repentance, that if he was just taken on face value, so today you've repented, tomorrow come and do a talk with us and accompany us and be from the A'imma of Ahlul Sunnah in our time. Then, that type of tawbah, if he was accepted, they would not know what would happen the day after or the day after that. So they watched him. But the sincerity of Abu Hassan, that when Imam al-Barbahari said what he said to him, did he say, okay, do you know how many people I left? How many thousands of people used to sit in my durus? I left and I repented from all that to come to you for you to speak to me like this? Khalas, I'm going back to them. Was that the attitude of al-Ash'ari, ya khiwan? That was not his attitude. His attitude was an attitude of a man of sincerity. A man who was truthful in his tawbah. Instead of becoming angry at the students of Imam Ahmed, or at Al-Barbahari, and even saying to Barbahari, I have more followers than you. Because the Mu'tazila were greater, were great in number of that at that time. And the people of Sunnah, as you can see what happened to Imam Al-Barbahari, that from time to time, that they were imprisoned, and they were restricted, and that the, that, 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 that the government or the, or the governors of that time and the rulers at that time, that they used to place restrictions upon them and even try to kill them and torture them. And that's why Imam al-Barbahari died in the manner that he died. So al, al, uh, al Abu al-Hassan al-Ash'ari, he could have said to Imam al-Barbahari, in that case, I leave you and I'm going back to my people and I will have thousands of followers and I will have station and I will have status in this, in this land and amongst the Muslims. And I don't need you, Imam al-Barbahari. I don't need you, Abu Muhammad. But he didn't do that, ya ikhwan. Look what he said. He said, فَخَرَجَ Meaning, al-Ash'ari, he left. وَسَنَّفَ الْإِبَانَ Then he wrote, al-Ibana. So instead of going away and becoming angry, he went away and became even more sincere. And then he wrote, al-Ibana. His final work in retraction. And in refuting the Mu'tazila and the Kullabiyya and the Jahmiyya. And affirming that his aqidah was the aqidah of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And then he died upon that, ya ikhwan. And during his life, all through his life, after his repentance, the students of Imam Ahmed and the companions of the students of Ahmed, like Barbahari, that they did not raise him. They did not raise him. They accepted his tawbah, but they would not raise him. It was after his death, Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari is being quoted today. After his death, which shows the sincerity of a man. That when he makes tawbah, he doesn't make it for me or for you. Or to show fulan and fulan. He makes tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether we raise him or whether we don't raise him. And what is awla and what is more befitting is that the one who makes tawbah from being a caller to bid'ah for many years is that he is not raised. That we do not raise him high. Rather, that he is tawbah. Inshallah, we say, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from him. And you are our brother in Salafiyyah. But you do not raise him to the level whereby now that he is raised as if he was an imam of bid'ah today and is an imam of sunnah tomorrow. But rather that we are patient and we watch him and we monitor him. If he proves over a long period of time that he is truly repentant, then alhamdulillah we direct the people towards him. So the Salaf were very, very careful, Ya Ikhwan, with regard to these affairs. But that just shows you some of the characteristics of the sternness upon the sunnah of the likes of Imam al-Barbahari. Now going to the muqaddima, so we're going to skip a few chapters where he mentions the various manuscripts and where those manuscripts are available and where he took the actual text of the sharh sunnah of Imam al-Barbahari and, like and, and also the tarjama or the biography of the great scholar of this era, Sheikh Salih bin, uh, bin Fawzan bin Abdullah al-Fawzan, Hafidahullah Ta'ala, we have mentioned on many occasions, even in Khutb you hear Sheikh Al-Fawzan's name being mentioned from the great scholars and the fuqaha of this era. But this muqaddimah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, he mentions muqaddimah al-mu'alliq ala al-kitab, fadilat al-Sheikh Salih Al-Fawzan. So this is the muqaddimah of the one who wrote, or the, the one who, who has commented upon the book. The noble Sheikh Salih Al-Fawzan. So Sheikh Ali Al-Fawzan mentions in his introduction, he mentions Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. For those of you who've got the Arabic version of the book, then it's page 39 in the two-volume version. 
So after praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the worlds, and then sending the salutations and the peace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon our messenger, upon our Prophet Muhammad, and then upon his uh, family and upon his companions, then Sheikh Al-Fawzan mentions, هذا الكتاب مؤلفه البربهاري He mentions that this book, its authorship is by uh, the author of this book, then it is Al-Barbahari. واسمه Al-Hassan. His name is Al-Hassan. Bin Ali, the son of Ali, the son of Khalafin, the son of Khalaf, Al-Barbahari. Nisbatan ila Barbaharin, wa huwa naw'un min al-adwiya. That this is an ascription to Barbahar, and Barbahar is a type of medicine. Allati la allahu kana yashtaghilu biha. And this is perhaps something that he used to uh, have his business in or he used to work in. Or yubi'uha fa nusiba ilayha. Or that he used to sell it and therefore he was ascribed to it. Wa huwa min kibar al hanabila. And he is from the greatest scholars of the hanabila, of the humbly scholars. Meaning those who take in fiqh the madhab of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. أخذ أمن أخذ عن الإمام أحمد مثل المروذي وغيره. He mentions that he took who he acquired knowledge from those who acquired knowledge from Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, the likes of المروذي and other than المروذي. And Imam المروذي رحمه الله تعالى then he is as as it as it is mentioned in the footnote that he is Ahmed bin Muhammad. Ibn al-Hajjaj bin Abdul Aziz Abu Bakr al-Marrudi. Ibn Abi Ya'la said that his mother was a Marrudiya, meaning from that area, and his father was Khawazimi in lineage. He was foremost from the students of Ahmed ibn Hanbal in piety. So he was from the teachers of Barbahari. Him being, meaning al-Marrudi, being from the former students of Ahmed ibn Hanbal in piety and virtue. So Ibn Abi Ya'la, he mentions, rahimahullah, that our Imam, meaning Ahmed ibn Hanbal, was friendly with him, delighting in his companionship. He took charge of his scabbards when he died and he washed him for the funeral. He narrated from Ahmed ibn Hanbal plentifully. Al-Marrudi died in the year 275. As it is mentioned in Tabaqat al Hanabila, volume 1, page 66, and Seer Alam al Nubala, volume 13, page 173. So then he mentions Sheikh al Fawzan, He studied deeply and extensively in knowledge. Akhad al Aqida, wa akhad al Fiqh, wa akhad al Ilma, and Kibar al Aimma. That he mentions that he acquired knowledge. That he acquired aqidah and fiqh and knowledge from the great imams. Wasmul kitab, he mentions, and the name of the book is Sharh al Sunnah, the explanation of the Sunnah. He mentions, Al Murad bi Sunnati Huna, and the intent of the term Sunnah here is Tariqatul Rasul, is the path of the Messenger of Allah. لَيْسَ الْمُرَادْ بِهَا الْمَعْنَى الْمُسْتَلَحَ عَلَيْهِ إِنْدَ الْمُحَدِّثِينَ He mentions that the meaning here, or the intent here, by the term sunnah, is not the terminology that is utilized by the scholars of hadith, the muhadithin. أَنَّهُ مَا ثَبَتَ عَنِ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وسلم مِنْ قَوْلٍ أَوْ فِعْلٍ أَوْ تَقْرِيرٍ He mentions that it is not this terminology that is utilized by the great scholars of hadith, the muhadithin, who say that the sunnah is that which is established upon the Prophet ﷺ by way of statement or action or tacit approval. So that is not the meaning of the term sunnah in the title of the book, Sharh al-Sunnah, or explanation of the sunnah. وَإِنَّمَا murad مَا هُوَ أَعَمُّ مِنْ ذَلِكَ He said, indeed, the intent here is more general than just what the Prophet ﷺ said, or what the Prophet ﷺ did, or what the Prophet ﷺ approved of. So the intent here, the more general intent of the term sunnah here, is the path of the Messenger of Allah. 
and the path of his companions الصالح, and the path of the righteous predecessors who came before and he mentions and this is the sunnah that has been transmitted and passed down whether it be in the affairs of the belief or in the affairs of worship or in the affairs of the fiqh meaning those outward actions of worship or whether it be in the affairs of manners and etiquette he mentions all of this is termed with the word sunnah in a general sense. So then he mentions فَقَدْ يَذْكُرُ مَسَائِلِ الْفِقْهِيَّةِ مِثْلَ الْمَسْحِ عَلَى الْخُفَّيْنِ So he mentions even in this work, meaning Sharh al-Sunnah of Barbahari, that, that the author he mentions issues and masail that are related to fiqh. Such as, for example, the wiping over the socks. The khufain, referring here to socks or leather socks. One nikahil muta'a. And also to the temporary marriage. That he mentions these types of affairs in this book. Min babi raddi ala al firaq dalla mukhalifati fiha. Al mukhalifati fiha. That he mentions that he mentions them from the aspect of refutation upon the sects of misguidance who who were in opposition to these affairs, meaning that they were in opposition to the Sunnah. So he mentions also. That also what he would do, the imam in this book, meaning Al-Barbahari, that what he would do is that he would reiterate some matters for the purpose of emphasis or relevance or to elaborate further or for some other, as he has mentioned, or that he would mention some affairs and reiterate them for the relevance as, as we have mentioned, to elaborate further or for some other knowledge-based purpose. And then he mentions, in general, وَالْبِالْجُمْلَةِ فَهُوَ كِتَابٌ مُفِيدٌ And in general, this is a beneficial book, a book of great benefit. And then he mentions, وَتَأْتِ أَحْمِيَتُهُ مِنْ قِدَمِهِ فَهُوَ مِنْ كُتُبِ السَّلَفِ الْأَقْدَمِينَ الَّذِينَ آثَرُوا الْعَئِمَّةِ الْكِبَارِ that he mentions and what follows is a mention of the importance uh, of this book from the, from the aspect of its age and from the books of the Salaf of old. Those who lived in the time and the era of the great Imams. عنهم, and that they took from the great Imams. Meaning that these books, the likes of Al-Barbahari and whatever else he's going to mention what is to come, that these Imams wrote their books and they penned down their books and they took the knowledge of what is contained in the books from the imams who came before them. And that they would narrate aqidatahum as safiyah that, that they would narrate from them the pure, pristine aqidah. And then he mentions, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon the imam al-jaleel, upon the, upon the honorable and noble imam. And then he mentions, wa ma'ana sharh. And the meaning of the term sharh or literally translated as explanation, a bayan. That the sharh here means bayan, meaning to clarify. لَيْسَ مَعْنَاهُ أَنَّهُ يَشْرَحُ كِتَابًا مُعَيِّنًا That he mentions, and the meaning here is not that he is explaining a particular book. أو يفسر كِتَابًا مُعَيِّنًا Or that he is about to give commentary or to give an exegesis of a, of a particular book that he is about to embark upon. So the term here, Sharh al-Sunnah, is not that he is explaining a book called a sunnah Like for example, you find Sharh Kitab al-Tawheed. A book in explanation of Kitab al-Tawheed. So, so what is the name of the book that he's been explained? Kitab al-Tawheed. The Sharh means that someone has come along and explained the book, Kitab al-Tawheed, or for example, Sheikh al-Islam, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab. 
The meaning of the term Sharh al-Sunnah here is not that there is a book called As-Sunnah and Barbahari came and explained the book called As-Sunnah and then it was called Sharh al-Sunnah. No. Rather, he mentions that this is not the case here. وَإِنَّمَا مَعْنَاهُ أَنَّهُ يُوَدِّحُ تَرِيقَةَ السُنَّةِ Rather, the intent here and the meaning here that he is clarifying and making clear the path of the sunnah. هَذَا مَعْنَا شَرْحُ السُنَّةِ and this is the meaning of the term Sharh Sunnah or the title of the book Sharh Sunnah. So we'll mention this last sentence and then we'll conclude for the day, inshallah. He mentions Sheikh Al Fawzan. He mentions Khan Al Awailu Yusamuna Kutubul Aqeedah Bi Sunnah. He mentions that the early scholars that they used to give the give they used to entitle their books with the name as Sunnah, their books of Aqeedah with the name As-Sunnah. So when you hear some of the books of the Salaf called As-Sunnah, what they are referring to here is the Aqeedah. Mithli had al-Kitab. He mentions such as, for example, this book. Wa mithli As-Sunnah lil Imam Ahmad. And likewise, the book called As-Sunnah of Imam Ahmad. Wa Sunnah li ibnihi Abdullah. And likewise, the book called As-Sunnah of the son of, the, of Imam Ahmad whose name was Abdullah bin Imam Ahmed, he has a book called also a sunnah So this book is called what? Sharh al-Sunnah. Meaning explanation of the sunnah. The term sunnah here referring to what, ya ikhwan? The aqidah. So what he's saying in reality is Sharh al-Sunnah, the explanation of the aqidah upon the way of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He also mentions, like for example, a sunnah of Imam Ahmed. It was called a sunnah but it is in reality a book of Aqeedah. Likewise, a sunnah of Abdullah, the son of Imam Ahmed. A sunnah, but the book is a book of Aqeedah. He mentions also a sunnah lil athram of the Imam al athram And that is also called a sunnah, but it is a book of Aqeedah. And he, likewise, he mentions wa sharh al usul al asuli i'tiqadi ahli sunnati wal jama'a lil lalakai. He mentions also the book sharh. Which, which roughly translates as the explanation of the foundations of the aqidah of Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah of the great Imam Allah Lakai. So all of these books were given the title as Sunnah. But the term Sunnah in the title of these books is in reality referring to what, Ya Ikhwan? The aqidah. The aqidah. So upon that note, inshallah, because I want to be quite strict with the timings of these duros that we keep them to about 50 minutes or thereabouts so as not to bore you so that inshallah by the next time that you are comfortable with the timing and with the length of these duros so that inshallah by the time you come back next time that you don't remember it as a laborious class inshallah barakallahu feekum so it's a bit of a bribe to bring you back inshallah next week jazakumullahu khairan if anyone wants to have a look at this map this is a map of some of the older regions in the time of the Tabi'een and the Atba'u Tabi'een, the Sahaba, the Tabi'een and the Atba'u Tabi'een. There are two maps here. The top one is the map just in the time of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. The time of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman predominantly and Ali. The map below is the time of the Tabi'een and the Atba'u Tabi'een. If you look at the right hand side of the map, when you look at it on the right hand side, you see the regions of Khurasan. These are the regions where the compilers of the Sunan predominantly came from, and likewise the likes of Bukhari. So you'll see, for example, there Bukhara, and you'll see there, for example, Khawazim. You'll see there, for example, Al Marwa, where Imam Al Marwadi came from. You'll see there, for example, Al Naysabur, where Imam Muslim came from. And you can see uh, that they in fact border what is modern day Persia or Iran on the border with Afghanistan and then further north what you would uh, class today as regions such as, uh, Bukh uh, regions such as Bukhara or Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan and Turkmenistan which are modern day former Russian republics and all of these regions my brothers and sisters you can imagine and there's a small scale at the bottom which tells you the distance from Medina to some of these places. And I did a rough calculation 
and they come out to some of them being a thousand miles away from Medina or up to 2,000 miles away in some of those regions. Yet they would walk from their lands 2,000 miles, which is approximately, let's say, from France into the Middle East, or as you enter into Saudi Arabia, maybe slightly less. So it's a huge distance that they used to travel without trains and airplanes and cars, walking or on the back of a donkey or a mule, traveling in pursuit of knowledge. And this is why you begin to understand why the likes of Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullahu ta'ala spent 46 years in pursuit of knowledge, traveling from the various lands. Imam al-Bukhari from Bukhara, and you'll see it on the map, uh, if you want to remember it, it's in the section, which is, for you map readers, it is uh, J3. So if you go across the top, it's J, and across the side, 3. And if you look in, in the region of J3, that's where many of the scholars came from, from the scholars of Hadith. So those of you who want to go can go, but those of you who want to, I want this back, by the way. Yeah. I don't want to have to announce it after Juma tomorrow. Barakallahu feekum. But you can have a look at this, inshallah. You can take it from the right. And for those of you who have attended, Jazakumullahu khairan. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa